we have been asked by the National Science Foundation to discuss our philosophy and protocols concerning research training in our lab. Really, our philosophy has developed from our postdoctoral years at Harvard. And most fundamentally, we consider the University of Oregon, like any other major research university, to be primarily a community of scholars, where our basic job is to create the new knowledge and to pass it on and do so in collaboration with our colleagues and students. We have often wondered why it is that some graduate students and postdocs cannot wait to get to their experiments. They come into the lab, they rush to their experiments, and they see how the data have developed over the last 24 hours. They write it down, they plot it up, and they sit there in front of the computer and just are thrilled. Other students linger over their coffee in the morning, come into the lab somewhat reluctantly, and sit down and maybe bat around a few ideas, and pushing them towards their research is somewhat of a job. We believe that the difference between these two groups of graduate students depends upon whether they have had a no-secrets approach to experimental research as undergraduates. So what is a no-secrets approach to undergraduate research training? To be honest, if you are a research scientist, it's the best job in the world. It's like you get up every day and you can't believe you actually do this for a living. Um, there are, however, so many misconceptions about what a research scientist actually does. And one of the things that we are sure to do is to communicate that these um, myths must be dispelled. So I think first and foremost, many young students come into a laboratory setting thinking that what they do is they come in, they put on a white lab coat, button it up in the morning, stay for a few hours, then unbutton it, hang it up and leave, go have a beer. Not so much. So in truth, undergraduate research training tells us that this is not really a nine to five kind of job. You never know what time of day or night you actually may be involved in having to run an experiment or check on how the animals are doing in an ongoing experiment. Another typical mis misconception is that if I'm a research scientist, I'm going to be rich. Um, you may be rich in terms of your personal life, but in terms of your financial life, it's probably not a certain thing. Another myth that needs to be expelled generally is that discovery is simple. Discovery is actually not simple. It is a long, time-consuming process, often involving many people working together. So how do we communicate this to students? First of all, we pay attention to what young students are doing in their la laboratory courses and other coursework that they do with us. And students that are particularly interested in what is happening ask good questions. Those undergraduates are invited into the lab to see if they enjoy doing research. Everyone starts at the level of animal husbandry. If you can't raise your animals, you can't run an experiment. So, Sounds simple, but it's actually very tedious. Uh, you have to learn how to use the equipment for running animals. You must keep populations separate at all costs. Many details. Our graduate students and we pay attention to these details. At the same time, all undergraduates are required to come to lab meeting, which is held at everyone's favorite time of the day. That is Monday morning, 8 a.m., 52 weeks of the year. Lab meeting runs from 8 to 9, required, and then goes on until 11 for special questions. During those lab meetings, undergraduates see what graduate students are talking about, what we are doing, and they all have the chance and opportunity to give PowerPoint presentations about what they are doing, what they would like to do, things related to what we are doing, and then we ask and answer, have them answer questions as if they were at a typical national meeting. Um, 
I know it isn't necessarily the most popular question, but I typically ask them, so who cares about your research? What difference does it make if you have found that result or not? So every undergraduate student, in short, has an opportunity to see that doing research can be really interesting. It also is going to take time and will present challenges. For those that love what they're doing, we give those people independent projects or have them do collaborations with more senior students in our lab. Many of the undergraduates in our lab have published papers themselves in referee journals, and that helps them to take their next steps into graduate school. At least as important are the probably one in four students that enter our lab to do research that decide that they really don't like research. Um, it's too isolating, it's too different from what they expected, and that in fact their grandfathers were right all along that where their passion really is, is in history or the law or perhaps business. To have the opportunity to decide at the earliest possible age that research science is not for you is a gift to everyone because it saves time, effort, money, and a great deal of unhappiness, because if you enter a graduate program and find yourself as a postdoc unhappy with your life's work, you will not be contributing successfully to science as a whole. In addition to undergraduates, we are also involved in graduate student training. Chris and I have the basic philosophy of never taking on more than two PhD and two master's students at one time, because we feel that students at this level require and really need and benefit from our attention, our feedback, and our actually working very closely with them, and we do not want to spread ourselves too thin. We are not only mentors of graduate students, we also believe in training graduate students to be mentors themselves. We encourage them to take on undergraduate researchers, uh, we call them larval researchers in our lab, and be their mentors in their independent projects, or even to incorporate undergraduate students into their own doctoral and postdoctoral research. We also insist that graduate students write and be senior authors on papers that are submitted to referee journals, and in addition, we provide networking training to our postdoctoral students. When visiting speakers come and Chris and I have a chance to talk with them privately, we incorporate postdocs into these private conversations. Also at national meetings, we introduce the postdocs to senior people in our field. And that way, they will be able to develop their own networking before they leave our lab. More recently, uh, we have allowed postdocs to act as not only seniors, but also corresponding author on the bulk of papers coming from the lab. In this way, they may gain experience and establish a name for themselves as they enter an increasingly competitive job market. Over the last three decades, we have had probably more than 500 students come through our lab for research training. Some of them are now endowed professors and director of state and federal research programs in genomics and international public health. Others are in medicine, dentistry, veterinary medicine, industry, communications, and journalism. All of them, regardless of their chosen field, use their undergraduate and graduate research training they have received in biology in our lab in their chosen profession. They all carry with them a deep appreciation for the experimental method and the commitment required to undertake truly transformative research. They also take with them an enduring respect for the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and other public and private agencies that provide the funding that makes novel paths to discovery possible. Whenever possible, we do our collaborations in-house. We have many wonderful collaborators here at the University of Oregon. 
We have an amazing director of genomics here, and he is always there with a helping hand when we run into a problem, which is rather frequently. And we have collaborators from all over the world, and we're very grateful for all of their input. In short, many minds working together, many hands working towards the same goal, is ever so much more effective than just one single individual. We have asked Doug Turnbull, the director of the core genomics facility at the University of Oregon, and several students to briefly discuss their research in our lab. I'm Doug Turnbull, that's D-O-U-G-T-U-R-N-B-U-L-L. -L. I'm director of the genomics and cell characterization core facility at University of Oregon. Yeah, so, um, so for Bill and Chris's research, they want to quantify the expression of uh, thousands of different genes over time, and uh, the assay they're using to do that is uh, quantitative real-time PCR. So in order to, to set up those experiments, um, you need to do this in a multi-well plate where you, know, you have 96 wells on a little piece of plastic, and a very precise, consistent volume of several different reagents needs to be added to each well in this plate. If you have you know, too much of one reagent in well A um, versus you know, not enough of that reagent in well B, you'll get different readings that are actually wrong. So we need to set up these assays in a very consistent way. And Fortunately, here in the, the core facility, we have a liquid handling robot that um, allows us to do that. It's a lot more reliable. It's slightly faster than a human doing it, but really the, the great thing about it is its consistency. Um, it's the same volume delivered to each well in the plate uh, every time. So my name is Rudy Borozek. I am a doctorate student in the Bradshaw Holzapfel lab. My name is Mary Wood. I'm a master's student in the lab. So Mary and I are interested in the fitness consequences of the evolutionary transition of, uh, from biting to not biting uh, in the pitcher plant mosquito, why am I a smithy eye? Specifically, we're interested in seeing how this transition has affected life history traits in our mosquito, such as pre-adult development, uh, adult longevity, uh, reproductive effort, and reproductive allocation. Yeah, at the same time, we've been uh, imposing selection for biting um, for almost 20 generations now, and we hope to use this uh, biting line to better understand uh, the relationship between propensity to bite and uh, disease transmission. So um, this mosquito is really unique, and the whole system is really unique, uh, in that in the southern portions of its range, um, the mosquito will bite, um, females of, of southern populations will bite. Um, however, in the northern portions of its range, uh, the mosquito absolutely will not bite, so it's totally lost the ability to do so. And this allows us to make really uh, unique and important comparisons between biters and non-biters um, within the same species in their natural environment. There are a couple different types of comparisons that you can make. One type, and what Rudy and I are interested in, is life historical comparisons. So seeing how traits like reproductive effort vary between biters and non-biters. But you can also make comparisons at the level of the genes, seeing how gene expression varies between biting and non-biting mosquitoes. And so this would allow us to determine the gene or genes responsible for the biting phenotype. And that, that isn't known currently and would make a really big impact in medical research. So Nicholas Allen DePatty, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S, A-L-A-N, D-E-P-A-T-I-E. And my title is Master Student in the Bradshaw Holtzoffel Lab. I am interested in determining variation, if any, in the key genes that underlie the daily biological timing mechanism, uh, which is known as circadian rhythm, in why am I a smithy mosquito, and I'm doing this over a geographical range. So what I'm doing is measuring actual gene expression of the five core daily circadian genes that are involved in a transcription translation feedback loop. So what that means is we're studying elevational gradients as well as latitudinal gradients. So our latitudinal gradient is we have populations that range from the Gulf Coast of Florida all the way up the coast into Newfoundland, Canada, and our elevational gradients that we have are from sea level all the way up into the Appalachian Highlands in North Carolina. So we're doing this by using sensitive genomic tools called quantitative PCR, which allows us to measure gene expression levels at any sample we put in the machine to do these analyses. My name is Nicole Kingsley, that's spelled N-I-C-O-L-E, K-I-N-G-S-L-E-Y. I'm the senior undergraduate researcher in the lab. My research concerns the degree to which dominance and epistasis 
that is gene-gene interaction has contributed to the evolutionary transition from a blood feeding to a non-blood feeding a lifestyle in YMI Smithii. I'm also involved in the day-to-day -day maintenance and management of the lab, including the long-term development of the selected biting line. Jack Benda, J-A-C-K-B-E-N-D-A. -E I'm part of the bioinformatics team that is involved in gene discovery. So for example, we take the unknown contigs and singletons from the YMI transcriptome and we compare them against uh, genes in the NCBI database to find the unknown genes' names and functions. Uh, so right now, I am working on the computer and writing script to simplify data analysis. I'm Lauren Gomat. I'm L-A-U-R-E-N-G-O-E-M-A-A-T. I'm an undergraduate assistant here in the lab. I'm planning to get involved in an independent research project once the academic year begins. We currently have 200,000 Wyomaya smithii here in the lab that we are synchronizing in diapause to be used in future experiments. In these experiments, we replicate the natural environment by using the leaves of the pitcher plant. Um, I'm grooming these leaves in order to keep the plants healthy and producing new leaves. Uh, I am Liesl Benda, L-I-E-S-L-B-E-N-D-A, and I'm a research student at the lab. Key experiments in the lab are uh, run in real pitcher plant leaves in computer-controlled environment rooms which are programmed to replicate any environment from the tropics to the polar regions of Earth. I'm preparing insect meals, which are the exact biomass or weight that the pitcher plant leaves would capture in the field. L-E-A-N-D-R-A. Leandra Filiacci. F-I-L-I-A-C-I. -I. I'm an undergraduate researcher. So we work together to care for the animals while learning experimental skills that can lead to independent research. My name is Eric Young, E-R-I-K-J-U-N-G. So my experiments involve how YMI Smithii uses the length of day to regulate its seasonal development from Florida to Newfoundland, as well as from sea level to Mountain Highland, North Carolina. My name is Kasha Kalsa, spelled K-A-S-H-A-K-H-A-L-S-A, -A -A, and I'm a new undergraduate student with a particular interest in physiology. After becoming adept at raising mosquitoes, preparing food, and maintaining plants, I plan to work on a project aimed at the eradication of mosquito bloodborne disease. My name is Travis Newman, T-R-A-V-I-S-N-E-U-M-A-N. I'm looking at um, 30 known genes in the mosquito Wyomia smithii, um, important in the lipid metabolic pathway. I'm looking at the genes, particularly from the a static hibernating state to the reinitiation of active development. The reason for looking at um, this particular, um, these particular genes in, is in hopes of finding a, um, a point in the metabolic pathway that could be interrupted in hopes of controlling mosquitoes. My name is Mitch Rosanico, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L. R-E-Z-Z-O-N-I-C-O. -E in mosquitoes, blood taken from biting is assumed to yolk the eggs, that is for embryonic development. At the same time, carbohydrates are necessary to sustain adult development. Why my Smithii populations in the north never take blood meals, yet still produce batches of fertile eggs. My research is aimed at determining which um, nutrients are both necessary and sufficient to sustain adult development. The understanding of these nutrients and the transformation of blood feeding mosquitoes to non biting mosquitoes is important in helping to understand how to eradicate bloodborne diseases such as Zika, malaria, West Nile, and dengue.